So I, I, I just want to talk today about um, some research that I recently completed, which was looking at the coagulotoxic and neurotoxic effects of reef stonefish venom, so Cyanantia varicosa. So for anyone who, uh, you know, who, who hasn't been on planet Earth for the, since they were born and don't know what a stonefish is, essentially they are highly venomous fish. They have about 13 uh, dorsal spines associated with venom glands. Uh, they are part of the, the Sinantidae family of, of fish. And, you know, they get their name stonefish because they're highly camouflaged. Um, they literally look like stones. So they inhabit this, this species that I, I actually researched was the Sinantidae varicosa, the reef stonefish. And it actually inhabits uh, shallow reefs and tropical coastlines throughout the Indo-Pacific. And as you can see from this distribution here, they have a, a fairly large distribution across the Indo-Pacific. And so they actually encounter, you know, account for many uh, envenomations per year. So let's just take a quick look at what we expect from envenomation. So with all fish venoms and, and defensive venoms in general, you see intense pain, uh, probably some of the worst pain that has been described from any animal uh, sting. Arrhythmia, so a change in heart rate, for example, um, inflammation necrosis of the local wound site, and even hemolysis has been noted. And I just want to point you, everyone, to uh, a, a local news report here in Australia, which was a couple of years ago. So this guy had actually been stung by a stonefish, and this is what he had to say in, in his interview. I described the pain as excruciating because the word comes from crucify, and that's exactly what it is. There's no other way to describe it. So clearly, the pain of these things is so, you know, so intense that he's comparing it to being nailed to a cross. Um, so I came up with the idea for this project uh, because I was just, uh, you know, reading the literature and I noticed something interesting. Um, firstly, there was a huge gap within, within the research on this species, particularly the venom, um, with the majority of the research being conducted like 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and so there was definitely a need to, to actually kind of revisit this, this, this kind of work. And I think partly uh, this lack in research is is to do with fish venoms in general, uh, are very labile toxins, and they, they just literally kind of fall apart under, under simple lab conditions. And so a lot of assays can, you know, be inconclusive and, uh, and this kind of thing with the, with the venoms. Um, and another reason I wanted to actually kind of revisit this, the venom with this species is simply because a lot of the older studies, they were kind of ambiguous or, or left uncertain and not very conclusive in their, in their data. And I just want to talk a bit more about what I mean by this. So firstly, there's a few studies that actually looked at the effects of arrhythmia on the heart. Um, and so a few studies actually suggested or, or found that calcium channels, L-type calcium channels within the heart, particularly CAV 1.2 and the smooth muscle was actually being activated with, with, with crude venom or with stings of, uh, of this species. But then other studies actually suggested that it was beta androgen receptor activation. And now the confusion kind of comes in uh, because activation of beta androgen receptors also uh, by proxy kind of uh, activates calcium channels within the heart. And so it was uncertain if whether this calcium channel um, activation was, was, was some sort of false positive result from actual toxins binding to beta andro androgen receptors. Um, and so that was kind of really a standout stand point for me in the literature. And so let's look a bit more. So neurotoxicity, well, um, some studies actually showed that partial and com complete limb paralysis um, have been you know, in mice was, was shown with cyanantia varicosa venom. However, no studies were, were further looked at um, for this species for, for looking at neurotoxic components. Uh, closely related, the estuarine stonefish, um, there's a study conducted on the chick by Venta assay, and it, it actually suggested that there was nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptor blocking However, because these venoms are highly myotoxic and the, the type of assay the chick by venter is, it was uncertain whether this actually um, was, again, was a, was a false positive result in terms of, you know, we could, we could see this nicotinic action, but we wasn't saying if it was due to the myotoxic activity or whether there actually is toxins targeting these nicotinic receptors. And so what about effects on the blood? Well, no studies have actually looked at the effects on the blood from Cyanantia varicosa. Um, they've looked at closely related species, so the estuarine stonefish again, um, and they were shown to have anticoagulant properties. And then conversely, you have closely related 
uh, other scorpioniforms, such as the lionfish, which actually shows to have procoagulin venom. So again, there was just a, a huge gap in the literature for this species in terms of the venom function. So what did I set out to do? So I firstly wanted to clear up the ambiguous data um, with the nicotinic um, kind of receptor research and also the arrhythmia, so the, the calcium 1.2. And so I attempted to, to assess the binding of the crude venom of the species using mimetopes, which are essentially short synthetic peptides um, designed to essentially mimic the binding region of these, these, these ion channel receptors. And then I wanted to also assess, you know, if there was any effects on the blood to kind of, if it falls in line with closely related species. And then, as I mentioned previously, the, the fish venom in general are, are highly labile. Um, and so... They even under lie off last conditions, so freeze dried venom, for example, can, can have completely different effects and they can break down fairly easily. So I wanted to take an approach to see if the functions of, of the venom was actually different between fresh and lie off uh, venom. And as you can see here, there's a beautiful picture of, of a stonefish that we had in the aquarium. And there's me being all professional doing some venom extraction. So let's look at some results. Um, firstly, the fresh venom for uh, the stonefish, actually we've seen binding with the nicotinic receptor mimetopes. So there's something going on here. There's, there's clearly toxins that are, uh, are targeting the, the, the orthosteric site, the active site of these receptors. However, we see a huge um, difference between lyophilized venom and also the fresh venom. It was completely abolished. There was no activity at all with the lyophilized venom. Um, and this, maybe indicates that the, the, the toxins that are causing this action are possibly large or very large enzyme uh, proteinaceous uh, toxins that are easily degraded. And so what would be the ecological uh, need for a defensive venom to have these nicotinic binding toxins? Because we usually associate these kind of nicotinic toxins with, you know, predatory venoms, such as in, in the lapids, for example, with three finger toxins. And so we actually hypothesized that the the natural prey of, of, of venomous fish or fish in general, stonefish, for example, um, are things like rays and sharks. And so these actually, uh, they use prey handling, but their prey handling is essentially done with the mouth. And so they're highly sensitive in this region. And so if a venom can actually paralyze the musculature of this area, um, it would by default also increase the chances of escape for any fish that's within the grasp. Um, of the mouth of the shark or, or ray, for example. However, I think a lot of, you know, natural history observations need to kind of corroborate that kind of theory. So what about the, the calcium uh, CAV 1.2 binding of the um, smooth muscle in the heart? So we assessed all four domains of the voltage, sen voltage sensing domains. We observed binding only with domain four, which is, is slightly indicative of uh, potential activation of this, which is what we would expect if it, if it increases heart rate. Um, and there was no difference at all between lyophilized venom and the fresh venom toxins. So um, possibly small stable toxins, who knows that, that we could look into that further. And so what does this mean in terms of the, the literature, which is quite confusing? Well, I think now we've kind of added to this data. And so it suggests that both calcium 1.2 and also beta andrino receptor toxins are actually within the venom. And this kind of makes sense for a defensive venom because essentially defensive venoms are just designed to tend to dial up all the way to 11 and, um, you know, just make the, whatever function that the, the toxins actually binding to just to, you know, skyrocket through the roof to, for, for the escape. So two, two different types of toxins targeting the same function makes, makes a lot of sense for a defensive venom. So what about the coagulation? So we tested the venom across um, a few different uh, blood assays on, on human plasma. And we actually found that the venom, the fresh venom particularly, um, showed anticoagulant activity, significantly delaying clot, clot time. Um, however, we, we tried to distinguish where about this was, uh, these toxins were targeting. So we tested upon the intrinsic pathway. So things like prothrombinase complex, factor 10A, um, but we couldn't find any, any changes in the, in the clotting time. So we suggested that the extrinsic pathway or uh, the toxins are degrading phospholipids. There was actually a, a huge difference as well between lyophilized and fresh venom. Um, again, the lyophilized had no, no effect 
on this assay at all in comparison to the fresh. So again, uh, you know, it's clear that these, these fish venom toxins are highly uh, degradable under, under very simple conditions as, as lyophilization. So in essence, what does this all mean? Um, well, firstly, I think we need to do a lot more research on fish venom. I think there's, there's definitely a, a treasure trove of uh, potential functions that everyone's missing with, you know, this whole fresh versus lyophilized venom and, you know, how simple these toxins you know, kind of crumble under, under simple lab conditions. Uh, but I think, I think it's worth persevering and trying to, you know, figure out better biochemical storage techniques and, uh, and you know, these kind of things for the venom. Is there a potential for therapeutics within within the characterization of these venoms? I, I personally think so. I think fish venoms uh, in general, I mean, you can have within one fish venom, you can have very small toxins, such as you know, catecholamines, all the way up to huge enzymatic toxins with multiple subunits. So there's definitely a plethora of uh, you know, toxins and, and a range of toxins within venom in fish venoms. And we just haven't really, no, no one really looks at characterizing these, these fish venoms. Which is which is kind of a shame, um, and so yeah. So I think I've I've really you know highlighted this 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 fresh versus lyophilized venom and how you know, crucial it is to to look at a venom function. And does this have any effect on the anti venom for stonefish? Um, personally, I don't think it does. I think the anti venom for stonefish works very well, uh, um, and so I just think it's something that you know, manufacturers and, and, and future researchers need to be aware of that there could be a difference in, you know, potential, in, you know, the immunization of, of, of the venom if it's, if it's been lyophilized previously and versus fresh. So who knows? I mean, I'm not an anti-venom expert, but I think there could be something just to be aware of. And so, yeah, just to finish, I'd like to say thanks to everyone for listening. And if anyone's interested in fish venoms, you know, contact me and so potential collaborations or anything. Um, so yeah, that's it, thank you.